Ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome back to the stage your chair, Anita Arnand. Did they just announce me? Better get on stage then. Hello. Um, thank you very much. A full house as we expected. Um, and this is, this is, let me just tell you, this is a momentous event, a really important event and a powerful event for all of you uh, because these are the people with the five-year forward vision. They are the architects of the five-year forward vision. The CEOs, or the chief executives rather, who have... Um, have the task of actually implementing the vision now going forward. And this is your chance to ask them questions. Now, this is one of those really important times when you can reach for your phones, go to the interactive site, and if you think you're not going to get to a paddle, uh, you're not sure about the odds don't look good, uh, or you're a little bit shy, get your question in now. It is a really important session because the wall is down if you like. So please put your hands together to welcome to the stage Simon Stevens of NHS England, David Bennett from Monitor, Duncan Selby, Public Health England, David Bean, Care Quality Commission, Professor Ian Cumming of the Health Education England, and Bob Alexander from the Trust Development Authority. Welcome, welcome. And uh, just to warn you now, um, if you do see Duncan leaving, he is not flouncing off for any reason other than he has a family commitment to go to. Uh, so any, um, it might just be a coincidence if uh, it comes after a very tricky question. Um, so look, you are in effect, actually you know what, you are the oddest looking boy band I've ever seen. <laughs> just saying. Uh, <laughs> But we're sort of, we've been told a lot during this conference that uh, you are all in it together, that you are this great team, GB. Uh, do you have a fallout about anything? No, not normally. We, we had a few discussions about who's going to chair and we decided we we're going to have to rotate. I lost first. Ian's losing at the moment, but otherwise it's all harmony. I was trying to work out who's in charge. Exactly. Who, who is in charge? It's collective. It's collective. So you are, oh, it, you are basically the many-headed hydra. Is that, is that what you're telling us? <laughs> is that what it is? We're more than the sum of our parts. Okay. All right. Um, we... <laughs> there is an important... Um, I think there's a really important bit here, though, that um, I think one of the things we're trying to do is demonstrate that we can work together. And the challenge is um, that locally, and I've spent my career working in health and care, and actually the success of local work is about people working together. And I haven't, uh, at any time over my career, not had to work across different agencies, different organisations. In order to do that, you, have, you occasionally have hard conversations about what your priorities are, what are we going to do. And I think the five year forward view was a pretty important document about these are our priorities as we move forward. And I think what we're trying to do is demonstrate that. So it's not a frivolous question, Anita, that you've asked. It's about how are we working together. And I think what we've been trying to do is demonstrate that we can work together about some pretty important and, and stuff. I, I entirely didn't mean it as a frivolous question because you are passionate about what you do. You all have very strong ideas about how you get there. What have you, I mean, the, very honestly speaking, what have you now resolved, okay, you can give me a resolved example, what have you disagreed about in this process? <laughs> Duncan! So, so the question I thought you might be asking was, how did we... <laughs> well done, that man! How did, we, how did we agree this? Because what's never happened before is we've come together. And we know, David said, you know, at a local level, you only win together. You know, you, you, you can't do it on your own. It has to be done together. And however we organise nationally, we need to behave as though we're one. Now, that's not cheesy. This never happened before. This is the first time, 36 years in the health service, I've seen anything like this. Now, I own this. This belongs to me. OK, I've got a big part in the prevention piece, but I'm as committed to mod models of care and the efficiency programme every single word to this. So that's, that's what we've come together for. Now we did have a, you know, what's in here represents the collective effort of the six of us. 
There have been times, though. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to create division where there isn't one, but, but I, I detect you are human beings. I mean, that's, that's the thing. You're, that's the kindest that thing anybody's well. said in yes. days. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I just check yes. your evidence basis? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm led to believe that you are all human beings. And, and there have been, I mean, Bob Alexander, uh, I mean, you, you did a few months ago express some concerns publicly about uh, this sort of 2% efficiency and how it may affect uh, some of the areas that you deal with. Um, so tell me a little bit more about that. Okay, so there is a process for setting national prices that involves... We can't hear. Can we make sure that Bob's... Um, yes, try again, Bob. I can shout. It has been known. Um, so we have, a, we have a very clear... Have we got a mic? Can we have a handheld to Bob and that way we can just uh, speed on until the... Uh, thank you, number three. <laughs> <laughs> So now you know who the lead singer of the band is. Um, <laughs> I knew it! <laughs> so we have a national process for setting national prices. And that is a consultation process. And it's there for a reason. And I wrote, as people know, because it got somewhere, I wrote a letter to both to both monitor at NHS England expressing my view of how the prices that were being proposed could impact in the way in which they had been done. And then there was a response to the consultation process and things have moved on. Hmm. And that seemed like an utterly appropriate thing to do. And we are now in a place which I actually think is better for the pricing process and we are now able to take that information and that approach and play it into what we think the five-year position is going to be and I think that's healthy. I, I suppose it was an it was it might have been a glimpse David into what goes on behind the closed well, doors. It, I think know? that's a very important point because in the past that's exactly how things like this would have got settled. It's all behind the closed door and then the world would be told what the answer is. I think one of the advantages of the way we're set up at the moment is that we are having these discussions explicitly between us and sometimes publicly, and there is nothing wrong with that. People can have honestly different points of view, and then we have to discuss them through. Absolutely. Um, we're we're going to take some questions, so please, if you, if you have a question, put your hand up and one of the lovely panel people will come to you. Uh, but just sort of on the overlap question, we've been getting, you know, we did this interactivity uh, uh, thing uh, today. and. Um, a lot of people have buttonholed me, and this is also coming through here, which is, um, can you not just sort of merge some of what you do? Because there does seem to be an overlap. Your public health, you talked about prevention and fizzy drinks and sugar. Uh, you have TDA and you have Monitor. Uh, both of you deal with money in a certain way. Is there any kind of rationalisation? Could we have fewer seats next year? What do you think? Uh, who wants to take that? Uh, oh, don't applaud me. Oh, God, it goes to my head. Don't applaud me. Who wants to take that? So that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Um, so I'm interested in the public's health. Public health is a discipline, it's a profession, it's an expertise and it matters, but it's not the point. What I'm interested in is the public's health. What improves the health of the people? Now, the health service has a fantastic and massive contribution to make. And I'm delighted to hear uh, Simon talking about the problems of obesity in our children, the fact that one in five are still smoking, and that belies inequalities that haven't altered in 40 years, and we should be concerned for that. So I'm delighted that the NHS, in the guise of Simon, but also David and Bob, Ian and David, are talking about this. So don't look at me and think I'm the one who's got the, the, the responsibility. Uh, it's everyone's, and I know time is short, so I won't go far to except to say that there's no like single answer or silver bullet. It doesn't belong to any of us. It belongs to all of us, mm -hmm. and you know I'm 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 just delighted okay. uh, to hear the the talk. And you know you're talking about what's different. When have we ever, as an NHS, had a conversation about why? Mm. We've only ever dealt with the consequence. The five-year forward view speaks to that like never before. 
Um, I, I'm aware that um, uh, the other David and Ian are remarkably quiet at the moment, and we will sort that out in, in just a second. But just on that one, uh, you know, you, 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 the thing you got lippy about yesterday, I just oh, wanted yeah. to come back. Why didn't you go further still and say, you know what, actually, this is so important. Why don't we tax these unhealthy foods, these sugary drinks, or why don't we at least push? I know you can't, but you've got the ear of Jeremy Hunt. He was here. Why don't you push for that and then wallop that on us, maybe an NHS tax? help you out that 22 billion hole? Because I have a game plan for how to move the public debate on, on these topics, and it doesn't include answering that question just yet. <laughs> <laughs> but that is even better than my answer. Uh, right, okay. <laughs> Glad I asked you then. Let's take some of the questions from the floor. Uh, number four over there. Um, Steve Kell, co-chair of NHS Clinical Commissioners. Um, a question about funding. CCGs are desperate to shift funding out into um, out-of-hospital services, and yet national directive makes us plan for increasing activity in, in hospitals. So my question is, when, do we, uh, when can we expect to be supported in making this change, which I think is essential in delivering the vision in the five-year forward view, and what's the role of the panel members in enabling this? Who would like to take that question? Go on. Well, if nobody else would, I think it probably would default to me as the victim, or uh, the, the cause of the victimisation that uh, Steve is referring to. I mean, the reality, Steve, as you know, and by the way, I would pay tribute to the leadership that Steve and Amanda Doyle and others in NHS clinical commissioners are playing on this, is that collectively, as commissioners, we have to make some pragmatic judgments as to the speed at which we can move on that alternative investment and service redesign agenda. And the truth is that uh, CCGs collectively, through no fault of their own, underclubbed their estimates as to what was going to be the emergency growth in 14-15. And as a result, hospitals during the course of the year then found that they were having to, on an unplanned basis, put in extra capacity to deal with it. So the dilemma here is that if you look at the emergency activity growth in 14-15, it was probably somewhere between 3 and 4% across England but that was slowing down quite substantially by the end of the year. So do you go for 0% or half a percent emergency activity growth, which is kind of what the initial uh, proposition was, or do you go for nearer to 4%, uh, which would have been a repeat of last year, but which would then crowd out all the investment that is being rightly desired for community health and primary care services. And so the pragmatic judgment that we've collectively made is that we should go somewhere down the middle and assume probably 2 to 3% for this year and seek to make further progress in subsequent years. So there, there's, no, there's no easy answer here. Um, I think if uh, hospital uh, audience members were talking, they would uh, support the fact that we should have uh, realism and planning and truth in advertising, but still combine that with the ambition that you rightly described. Um. I have a, a question that will uh, uh, get both of, both of your, I'd love your thoughts on this, David Bean from the CQC and also Professor Ian Cumming. We had a really constructive session this morning about regulation, actually, and a lot of, uh, were you there? I don't know whether, if either of you were there, but it, it was a fascinating insight into what people have to, to, to deal with at the moment. Now, they have these green and red grids, which are very clear and, and uh, they are front-facing. And I was told a number of times by people saying, look, you know, if we get the red grid, the red boxes in the grid, how exactly do we deal with recruitment? Because you tell me, and perhaps this is for you, and you touched on this with nursing, you know, at the current rate, to get this 24-hour wrap, 24 wraparound service you're looking at 2019, how are they meant to recruit when morale is on the floor and people just don't want to work in a red box hospital or trust? Okay. Well, I think that there's a variety of factors at play in the moment, particularly with the nursing workforce. So, as, as some people may have heard me say yesterday, that the demand, particularly into acute hospitals for acute nurses, has gone up by 21,000. So, there are 21,000 more acute nurses needed now than there were two years ago. That is a result of mid-staffs, that is a result of the relentless drive to improve quality, to drive up to drive up standards. Now, 21,000 is the total number of nurses that we train in one year in this country. So we are never going to be able to fill all those posts in, in one go. 
So what are we doing? Well, we have increased the nurse training numbers. We now have about uh, 1,500, 1,600 extra uh, nurses a year going into training. But it takes between three and four years for them to come out the other end. And there is no way of short-circuiting that to get degree level, properly qualified, properly trained nurses. So what else do we need to do? We need to look at better retention. If you look at different employers across the country and look at the retention rate, widely variable. We need to look at return to practice. We've currently got um, just short of 1,500 people going through return to practice programs to return to nursing. And actually, let me link that back to that retention point. Because I've spoken to a number of these nurses who are keen to return to the profession, and I've asked them why they left in the first place. I didn't get the answer I expected. The answer I got from the majority of people I spoke to was they left because of lack of flexibility. They couldn't work nights, they couldn't work weekends. The employers were telling them when they left that they were only interested in them if they would participate in a full shift programme and work weekends. We've got to be more flexible if we want to keep the workforce. But, you, but you've also got to be sort of geographically sensitive because, I mean, I suppose, uh, you know, Cornwall isn't, uh, you know, difficult to fill positions in Cornwall, but you've got Morecambe Bay and you've got other places that you've mentioned, and they are less attractive even for the trained workforce to go. So how do you address that problem? Well, I think GPs are probably the best example of that. So every single GP training post in London is filled year on year on year because people want to train as GP in London. If you move, um, generally speaking, uh, north and east in the country, it becomes harder to fill GP training programmes. So what we need to do is to make these jobs more attractive. And there's a range of ways of doing that by looking at, first of all, what attracts people to a particular geographical area, but also what extra we could offer in terms of training in that year, area. So one thing we're exploring at the moment is as an add-on to a GP GP training program giving people an extra year to allow them to spend more time in pediatrics or emergency care or whatever it may be so they're equipping themselves not just with the skills to be a GP but also some additional skills that they take forward into those areas. And, and the, definitely the feedback that I seem to get from this morning was the CQC uh, often comes with an army of people. It, it, it doesn't take into account how much doubling up needs to be done uh, on the wards or, or in the hospitals or in the trust itself to deal with the questions. Is there a way of taking your foot a little bit off the pedal? Because if somebody's doing badly, what they sense is that then there's a ratcheting. So the next time, there are even more people who come to inspect them. They have to put even more resources into dealing with what you inspectors need. And they're, they're almost being set up to fail. So this is a really important question. And... Um you know, we've now done something like 60% of all hospital trusts, and you rightly drew attention to the red boxes. But let's also draw attention to the green and blue ones, the places where there's good and outstanding care. And what we know from those places, Anita, is that they are thinking about the skill mixes. The staff that they've got include OTs and physios on their ward, nursing assistants, not just nurses. They're using their resources flexibly and deploying them flexibly to meet the need because ultimately those boxes are about how well are the needs of patients in those services being met. And I think it's really important we don't detach this debate about staffing from the needs of individuals that need to be cared for. The size of our inspection teams are really about the complexity of the services that colleagues here are running and that we're asked to make a judgment on. And a large international teaching hospital must be one of the most complicated, complex organisations that we've got in England in either the private sector or the public sector. We've been rightfully criticised for having a simple, single approach to uh, the way that we inspect, so we changed that. So every service we look at will have a practising active clinician, an expert by experience, somebody that's using services, and an inspector. So if we're looking at eight core services over a large international teaching hospital, no more than three or four people are going to go into those individual services. But it's right that a consultant paediatrician is looking at paediatric services in the hospital, and that's what we've done. In a direct response to what's the credibility of inspectors but and do you, do you, do you have take the point that the ratcheting that goes on if someone is 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 failing or uh, is 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 hitting a red box situation more inspectors come so what's important is having said that there's a need to this organization better meet the needs of patients that are being treated that we go back and we check that improvements have taken place and David and, uh, and Bob's organisations are working alongside with them. It's another example of how we've been working together over this period. But we also know, don't we, and I think this is what Mike was saying this morning, that Bruce, when he put some hospitals into special 
measures out of the Keel review. They're now out of special measures. They've demonstrated improvements. Dr Foster did this work on demonstrating that special measures have accelerated improvements taking place. So we need to mature this system, but I think there's very strong evidence that improvements are taking place. And there's people in this audience that, um, and the Secretary of State paid tribute to some uh, this morning in his speech, who have turned around some of these hospitals and are now performing to a very, very high standard. Let's take some more questions from this audience. Let's go to number two and then number one. In fact, why don't we just get three comments from the audience and then we'll come back to the panel. Number two first, number one. And is there one over there in my blind side? If there is, we'll come back to you. Yes, number two. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Chris Butler. I'm the Chief Executive of the Leeds and York Partnership NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, my question uh, uh, is in two parts, really. The first part is an observation. That is, NHS people want to do the right thing in the right way. But there will be occasions, and it's happened in all of our careers, when you get into a bit of difficulty. And what I'd like to know from the panel, uh, as individuals, but also as, as a collective, how you, uh, what's the, things you, the practical things you're going to do to change from a culture of intervention to a culture of help and support. Thank you very much indeed. And we'll take a question here, number one. Number one. Thank yeah. you. Uh, my name is Jack Tar Singh. Could you uh, repeat that a bit louder? Hello. So the mic wasn't on. Yes, uh, my name is Jack Tar Singh. I'm the chair of uh, Coventry and Warwickshire Partnership Trust. And I want to link two key areas, prevention and health inequalities. Uh, Sam's already had one go at answering the question, so I think his priority is already being highlighted. But my question is, we've got £22 million to save. Clearly, prevention is one way we can make some of that saving. So what are the priorities that you're setting out in the prevention agenda? And how have you linked the priorities you've analysed to be the priorities against the health inequalities you know about? Okay. Let us, first of all, then go to David on, on that first point. Of, I mean, just to summarise it, um, more carrot, less stick would be a, yes. a good idea. So the first thing I would say, and I've said this many times in public before, but I'll say it again, I think being uh, in a leadership role in uh, one of our, for example, one of our provider organizations, the Hospital Trust and similar, is one of the most difficult leadership roles I have seen. I spent most of my career working in other sectors, and I really think these are very, very challenging roles. And I'm yet to meet a single person doing those roles who isn't doing their absolute best. So um, that's my starting point. Therefore, I'm absolutely clear that if we're going to ask more of people, and quite honestly, we are asking more of people, we've got to help you as well. Um, I try to emphasize this a lot in the letter I just sent out earlier this week on some of the things we're changing. We are specifically setting up a whole new directorate in Monitor specifically intended to help support the trusts that we're asking to make changes. We're working with Bob and the TDA on a lot of this. We're also working together with NHS England as well on looking at the, all the money that's currently and the resources are currently going into support for trusts to make sure that's as targeted as, as much as we can on providing real practical support on the ground. So I absolutely agree with that. Ian, you want to come yeah, can, can I just say something about, about values and behaviours? That we have a set of values and behaviours for the NHS laid out in the NHS constitution. We have spent the last 12 months ensuring that every student who NHS, who's being funded by the NHS, who's going into an education and training programme, is recruited on the basis of those values and behaviours as well as their academic ability. What we need to do is to get to a position where those those values and behaviours, as well as being applied to patients, are applied in how we interact with each other and how we interact with staff in our organisations. We remember when we first started talking about clinical governance, we, we came up with the concept of no blame. Well, the concept of no blame is wrong. We need a concept of fair blame. So if people are being negligent, if people are maliciously or willfully doing something wrong, then that is one area. If people need help and support and advice, that's an entirely different territory and completely in accord with our values and behaviours in the Constitution. Thank you. And, and on that prevention, Jagtar Singh's uh, question uh, on prevention, maybe, Duncan, you'd like to take that? Yeah, I just... <coughs> Is this working? Yeah, uh, working? Yes, it is, yeah. Uh, it's very difficult to see you in this room. It's, Tell uh, me about it. He's over here. Right yes, there. I just yeah. I think it was yeah. uh, Mr. Butler mm. up, up there. My, uh, he and I worked together 20 years ago. Um, and although I've spent uh, more recent years in acute services, I did all my best learning in the mental health services. And I just want to say that to you. Um, 
The five year forward view talks extensively and I think quite articulately about three gaps. It talks about a health gap, a care gap, quality gap if you like, it talks about an efficiency gap or a money gap. And they are inseparable in the, in the sense, I mean that's what the whole narrative's about. But the prevention part uh, talks about the essentially what the truth is that, we, that we're beginning to talk about, that it remains today the case that where you're born is the most important determinant of how long you live and, and more importantly, uh, how long you live in good health. And the gap for those uh, in the poorest uh, against the, the, be the better off in good health it is 19 and almost 20 years. And if you have a mental health problem, your life expectancy is no different uh, to where the adult population was in the 1950s. So when we think about prevention, it's in that context. And we, what we mean is, in, in the first instance, it, we, to try and bring uh, some focus to this. So looking at the evidence about what's killing people early, which is not the same thing as what, they, what ails them, if you like. What ails you doesn't kill you. What ails you is mental health problems. Mental health problems don't kill you. What kills you is whether you smoke and whether you drink and all this sort, sort of thing. So we've majored on diabetes, if you like, as a dry run uh, to see how we could together work both about prevention, uh, crucially, uh, but, but then also about treatment. And, and we know because diabetes is the leading, is becoming the leading, I mean, it's a, a basket of cardiovascular issues, but it's a major problem. And one in three of us will have type 2 diabetes within 15 years if we don't act on it now. But to speak to the inequalities, there are five or six other areas where we're about to uh, come out and talk to folk about. And th they, those range from uh, smoking in pregnancy and the importance about babies getting the proper birth weight and meeting milestones, about falls in the frail elderly, which is a massive opportunity for us, alcohol interventions. I know time's short, but just to give reassurance that as we make progress in these areas, we will close those gaps. That's the point I'm trying to make. The point isn't about managing the consequences better. The point is about avoiding them. So they say clever people solve problems, wise people avoid them. We take, we take the point. Um, let's put paddles high in the air if you've got questions. We'll go to number six first, then number four, then number two. But just, if you see me fiddling around with my phone, I'm not bidding on eBay. It's just that some of you are sending <laughs> questions in. And one of the ones that is really uh, coming across quite strongly, and Simon Stevens, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, and also Bob Alexander, you too. How, they're not happy with what we've been talking about, how we've dealt with the question so far. How are the ALBs going to make their contribution to making savings and contribute to the solution. They want to know how much pain you're feeling. Well, one of the things we've got to do nationally is make sure that we, consistent with discharging the responsibilities that are set for us by Parliament and by the Government, are as efficient as we can be in our own activities. Certainly the NHS commissioning system, we have cut our running costs by over a third in two years. And anybody who has worked for NHS England or works for NHS England now will know that we've had successive rounds of redundancies which have had implications for the focus of teams who've had to go through that. But the net effect of that, if this is something, if, if behind the question is what are the administrative uh, costs of the National Health Service, we spend under three pence on the pound on all in uh, national running costs in the NHS compared with over 5% in, 5.2% in Germany, 5.6% in France, double or triple that in the United States. We are an administratively very lean system. Is there more we can do? Absolutely. And what I tried to say yesterday is that it's not just about those elements, it's also about the asks that we nationally make of local providers to make sure that they are consistent with the affordability and the funding that is on offer. It's about making sure that we don't introduce a set of perverse interacting targets, and that's why the results of Bruce Keogh's report today to ensure we've got alignment on planned care and RTT, I think demonstrates the direction of travel. It's about making sure that we marshal our forces collectively as we're doing on agency spending. So where individual institutions can't do it, together we can. So but, I yeah. think we get it and we're acting. And you're, and you're looking for new ideas. Uh, how about this one? I mean, you handle money at the TDA. You handle money at Monitor. Can't we merge you two into some kind of super organisation? Shall I start as the yeah, lead singer? <laughs> um, 
I think I think it's I think it's absolutely appropriate that we do more of what we've done most recently, which is share more activities between us, because a lot of our processes could be the same. Um, we could share expertise, because some of our expertise, skills and capabilities are slightly different, fundamentally because of the different, the different, um, the different parts of the sectors that we serve and the framework within which we operate. I think we can do more of that, and we will, and we have. And I think, actually, the approach to the success regime that I know Simon spoke about previously will be a good way of doing that. Okay. Um, I, I, do think, I, I do think, in the state we currently are, conversations about explicitly about organisation and restructuring are not as helpful as let's start joining up services and how we do things. And yet, that is a question that is being asked time and again, uh, and I'll ask it, why can't you merge? Uh, of course we could. Um, Bob's absolutely right. The single most important thing is that we work as closely together as possible. And we are, but there's more we can do. Um, the, if, even if you merge Monitor and TDA, and I completely accept there would be benefits in terms of uh, making it even easier to work closely together. Nonetheless, the number of trusts that we oversee would not change. The number of people, therefore, that we need to oversee those trusts would not change. The, uh, the, number of the amount of cost saving you make would be minimal. Not to say it's zero, but it would be very small. So there are arguments possibly for putting the two together, but it absolutely isn't about saving money. Okay, um, let's take uh, question number four, then question number six, and question number two. Number four first. Wayne Farrar, Vice Chair of New York Clinical Commissioning Group. Um, how do we, and more importantly, patients, in whose name you, you claim to act, actually feed back to you on our view of your, the quality and effectiveness of your performance? And when will your personal commitment to equality and diversity deliver us a band that is actually more reflective of the communities you're supposed to serve? Okay, uh, number six. Hi, um, hello. Yes. Hi, uh, David Robinson, uh, Director of Healthcare Insight at GSK. Um, one of the questions that's come up over the last couple of days about whole systems care, um, when or how will you guys work together to join up or review payments and incentives so it's aligned to actually deliver that whole systems uh, model? Okay, so whole systems care. Can you just repeat the last bit because the mic just went a bit fuzzy at the end. Say that last tiny bit again. So how will you align the payments and incentive systems that payments operate to system. make so sure you, you can much. deliver whole systems care? Lovely, okay. And uh, yes, number two. Hi, Alison Foster, Director of Quality Aylesbury Vale CCG. And although it's a very similar question to already asked, I think asking it twice might be uh, powerful, um, which is... Um, uh, how might you, so it's what's useful um, for us looking at leaders and hearing from leaders and their experience and um, is understanding what you do in your personal sphere of control and influence to change what you're talking about needs changing. So the diversity of the group, the diversity of the system leaders and the system that we're looking at is not what you, is, is described as what's needed in the five-year view when you engage communities and you're using community assets, yet we've got a big issue in the NHS about addressing inequalities in opportunity and reflecting diversity throughout the NHS. Okay, so what are you going to do to address some of those so issues? So that, that's twice asked the same question and it's getting applause. Um, so it is, it is very white and sooty, isn't it, up here? Um. Yes, it is. Uh, but let me, maybe I can have a first go at that. Uh, because uh, perhaps counterintuitively, uh, perhaps bizarrely, but I'm very proud to say that I have the opportunity to co chair the NHS Equality and Diversity Council. And in fact, earlier today, here at this meeting, the BME Leaders Forum, we were together again and we were charting the fact that clearly we need to change as an NHS and as a set of national organisations, including NHS England. Here are the facts. 13% of working age people in this country are from BME backgrounds. 22% of employees in the NHS are from BME backgrounds. 
But we have a huge issue, as indeed this panel is demonstrating, with filtration and stratification, not just at the level of individual boards and hospitals and provider organizations, but in the national leadership of the NHS itself. That is indisputable. The consequence of that clearly is that we are not doing right by the people who choose to devote their careers to the National Health Service, but as importantly, if not more so, we are not connecting with many of the diverse communities that our organizations are serving. And the work that Roger Klein, that you'll be familiar with, you'll be, uh, everybody will be familiar with, pointing out particularly what's happening at board level in some of our major urban areas with strong BME populations and weak uh, representation at the top of the organizations. That, I think, partly explains why we are failing sometimes to listen hardest to the people we need to serve best. So what are we going to do about it? Well, there are some mechanistic things that we can do, and I'm proud of the fact that the six organizations have come together to promulgate with the BME Leaders Forum, the Equality and Diversity Council, the first workforce race equality standard across the NHS this year. So we have collectively set ourselves the goal over three years of narrowing the gap in the experience between BME staff and white staff. When you look at the uh, proportion of our employees in all of our organizations who say that they are uh, bullied or discriminated or harassed or have career opportunities blocked, it is something like a twofold difference in the experience of being a BME member of staff and a white member of staff in many parts of the country. So we're committed to doing something about that over the course of the next three years. The first step to progress is to name it. Also, by the way, I would say that we need to celebrate the role that immigrants have played in supporting the National Health Service. And so on June 17th, for the first time ever, we're going to be celebrating Windrush Day, Windrush being the uh, boat that sailed from the Caribbean in 1948, the same year the NHS was set up, celebrated by Danny Boyle in the opening ceremony of the Olympics, never celebrated by the NHS. So anybody interested in joining us for that Windrush celebration where one of the folks who sailed over on Windrush in 1948 will be there as well, feel free to join us in a fortnight's time. Um, there, was, there was one, I, I, I just want to address some of the other bits of the questions um, before I, I come back to the panel and, and take a few more thoughts. But the other part of that question, which I will give to David CQC, is um, who, gives, who grades you, basically? You know, Monitor and the CQC and TDA go around uh, giving metrics of success. Who, what is your metric of success and who's judging you? So I have great fun at public accounts committees and health select committees and it feels like a real kind of uh, scrutiny of what we do and why we do. And remember, CQC was in special measures three years ago. You just look at the accounts and the transcripts at the health select committee. These were places of no hiding. Um, we have been on a journey in CQC about the changes we made, including the issue about diversity. I personally mentor a number of black staff within my organisation to signal at a micro level, at an individual level, that this is an important thing for us. We've been quite open and transparent about we're a white organisation. So I also build teams uh, of, uh, that um, are about leading CQC. This isn't about me and CQC. This is about the teams and the staff that work in CQC. But we do get scrutinised by Health Select Committee. I've got a board which is full of independently minded people who pull no punches in asking questions that are challenging. Uh, they range from QCs to journalists and um, we do, we broadcast our boards, the papers are there, people watch them and people will speak to me about the way that we've debated complex and difficult issues about how we do it. We're trying to model being transparent and I'm accountable to my staff. Uh, they expect me to lead them, uh, afford them with dignity. A big ish initiative for us this year is about well-being. How do I promote well-being within my organisation? How do we speak to each other appropriately and properly uh, and respectfully about colleagues? And we have, um, you know, one of the things that Steve Field did recently, he went and met a whole bunch of people who are homeless and said, what are the issues for us about how homelessness services should meet your needs? And our first general practice that was rated outstanding was a practice which was delivering care to homeless people. So I think we've tried to reach out to the range of communities that uh, you're there in services to serve so we can understand what are the issues that they need to meet their needs so that we can judge services in accordance with what people tell us. We think we are on the side of people using services. Okay, we're going to take more questions in a moment. Just before we do, though, I mean, one place which there is no whitewash about it is nursing. 
Um, and Ian, um, you've talked about the difficulty in recruiting and training people to, to fulfill this wraparound service. And in the meantime, foreign nurses are being used, a lot of them. Now, that plays a certain way in certain parts of the media. Um, do you want to speak to that at all? Well, I'd, I'd come back to the point that Simon made earlier on, that the NHS has always relied on a number of people coming in uh, from overseas to work in our NHS, to train in our NHS, in many cases to go back overseas, in some cases to stay here. They're a fundamentally important part of our workforce. What we must be clear about is that we're not going to lower standards. So when we're recruiting people from overseas, that we're putting through appropriate selection processes to make sure that they're fit for purpose. Thank you very well, much. To, yes. I want to, I want to give you if you want to ask me anything difficult, you've got two minutes. We've got two. <laughs> Who wants to do Duncan's head in before he goes? Uh, anybody? Uh, let's see. I don't know. We've got a question at number two, and we'll find out what it's about. There we go. Yeah. Uh, Sam Evington, GP in Tower Hamlets. 50% uh, of five-year-olds in Tower Hamlets are vitamin D deficient, have severe dental caries, cognitive development is 10% below the national average, 13% are obese, uh, by the age of five, that's doubled by the age uh, of 11. NHS has little to offer this group of our population. And so my question to the panel is, uh, what are they going to do to work with schools and the Department of Education uh, to create a sea change in the health of these children and their life opportunities in the longer term? Sam, is there anyone in particular you would like to answer that first? <laughs> I, I, anyone is the answer. I mean, it obviously Duncan's falls going, into Duncan. So let's go to Duncan. As I yeah, leave, there we go. It's no reflection on no. my <laughs> colleagues or, or the something. lead singer. Yeah. Okay. So this is seriously important. We have to get a bit. We need to like up the humility about 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 this. So we talk about the efficiency of the health service, which is really important, and and it's internationally understood for that. But when we look at the health of our people, we are absolutely not in the right place. And the most important measure, this is straight evidence, is the beginning of life and crucially being ready to learn on starting school aged five. Not through the lens of a, of a healthcare professional, but what a teacher would say that child is ready and able to do. And at the moment, as a country, only half of our children have that experience. We could look at it through a biomedical lens and we could look at dental caries and say that that's the, most, that's the leading cause of being admitted and, and under a, gen, a general anaesthetic for children. And we've got some brilliant things to say about improved dental caries, but we've got some really, really bad, uh, really, really bad outcomes as well. So the future is a contribution from the NHS, but it's no way the whole story. And you know what we gave local government in 2013 was the, the duty to improve the health of the people. We returned to local government what, what we took away from them 40 years ago, not to provide a public health service, but to improve the health of the people. We gave a duty to clinical commissioning groups to have regard to inequalities and together say, now what are you going to do together to improve the health of your people? The most important place to start is, is children. And the most important contribution to improving health for all of us is economic prosperity and employment. So adults having jobs is good for the health and well-being of our children. So it is about schools, it is, it is about the workforce, it is about the workplace, it's about local government, it's about industry, it's about retail, it's about government itself, it's about the public, the population and parents, it's also about the NHS. But the measure, the measure for how are we doing uh, it shouldn't be about hospital-based activity. It should be about length of life, life in good health, starting with our children. Now, I know what you do in your part of London, and I see really good work going on in other parts <coughs> of the country, but we need to be on a passion and a mission that our children everywhere get that great start. Okay. Duncan, thank you very much indeed. I know you have to run, so we can thank Duncan right now. Thank you very much indeed. Um, just while Duncan's leaving, I ought to just feed back from uh, what I'm seeing um, you are saying on the interactive side. Um, people are getting a little bit irritated that you, you made no, not one mention of women when you were talking about diversity at all. And that has, uh, that has greatly irritated. I just want to feed that back to you, that when it comes to diversity, women um, 
come into that bracket. Can I ask you a question, Simon? It's, again, it's one that's come here and it's being thumbsed up because we've got a, a, a rating system for questions. So if you really like a question, uh, then I look for the ones that have got the greatest number of thumbs up. And it's cheeky, which is why I like it as well. Um, do any of our leaders on the stage earn more than the Prime Minister? Do any of our leaders earn more than the Prime Minister? <laughs> you can tell why I chose it. It's... I do earn more than the Prime Minister, but I voluntarily took a 20,000 pay cut last year on this. I think, I think you know, the, the, the point that belies it, and I, I referred to it when I was speaking to Jeremy Hunt, is that there was deep-seated irritation, and it's been expressed to me time and time again, at that VSM letter that just went out while you're all packing your socks to come to this conference. Okay, um, so let, let me say, so, let me say, let me say so, yeah. this, because I, I get that, but I do think... Um, let, let me make a couple of supplementary points. I mean, the first thing is that relative to the scale of the challenge that NHS managers face if they were in any other walk of life, they would almost certainly be making more. Point one. Point two, this is the point Jeremy was making, I think it's right, we've just gone through a period and are still in a period where most of our staff, most of our frontline staff, our nurses, our therapists, our doctors, have had very constrained pay. And if we are to create and sustain this sense that we're all in it together, then what source for the goose has to be source for the gander. Second point. Third point, um, I recognize that neither of these uh, two uh, further points may be hugely popular, but I think we've got a duty to tell it as it is. We, I, all of us, are trying to make an argument to our fellow citizens, to the British public, about future funding of the National Health Service. And that's an argument we attempted to run through the election campaign to ask people to put their hands in their pockets for more. And one of the most corrosive things for our ability to win that argument is the sense that somehow we are feathering our own nest, which we are not, but we have to ensure that no perception like that can ever take foot. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, this may well be the last question of this session. Uh, paddle number two. Thank you. I'm Tim Cotton. I'm a GP from Hampshire. We've been talking a lot about the five-year forward view, and... Um, to use Anita's phrase, if you are the oddest boy band, I'd like to know, are we looking at one direction? <laughs> so what I'd like, thank you, what I'd like to know is, is what, if you could each answer this in one sentence, what to you is the most important transformational thing that you see from that document, Five Year Forward View, that we can take away? I couldn't have planned a better last question. So why don't Thank we you. run... That's an excellent last question. So why don't we go along uh, the line? Let's start with you, David. So I think the issue is about collaborative leadership. How are we going to work together? I think what we've been trying to do over the past few months and today is say we are going to work together on this. I see when I work locally, success was about the collaboration that existed between people. And by people working together where the whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts, then I think it is possible to address some of the things that Sam and others have talked about in the questions this afternoon. I'm not sure we're One Direction. As we've said, Bob is our lead singer, so actually we're Florence and the Machine. He's Florence, <laughs> we're the Machine. Um, I say this because I had the privilege of meeting Florence on Sunday. But, and, uh, and you're down with the kids, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right, exactly. yeah, yeah. Um, there's so much that could be said in answer to your question. I would just say this. I think we have a choice about uh, pessimism and cynicism or energy and optimism, and ultimately, if we can unleash that energy for improvement, a sense that better is possible, despite the fact that we are not living in times of affluence where we can buy ourselves to a better future, we will get there. That will be the single most transformative thing we can collectively bring to the party. And uh, David Bennett. Yeah, I think I come back to my point about support. I think, in a sense, it's not just us in it together, but it's all of us in it together. It is yeah. about us being supportive. That, I think, is absolutely critical for us. Thank you. Ian Cumming. This may be a predictable answer from me, but we have to focus on the current workforce and the education and training and development of the current workforce so we can take the best practice that is either already out there or being developed out there and spread it across the whole of our NHS. I firmly believe that if we could take the best practice that already exists and get everybody to do it, we are well down the path towards the £22 billion challenge. But we've got a cultural problem. We still have a not invented here attitude in much of our NHS. And we've got to convince people that if something works in Manchester, do you know what? It might just work in Liverpool. Okay. And finally, and you can sing it if you like, Bob Alexander. Fortunately, <laughs> I'm not going to. Um, 
This is awful when you're the last one on the line, isn't it? Because the obvious glib thing is all of the above. Uh, so I, uh, for me, the big piece is, will we be able to collectively, at our level, at an uh, organisational level, at a health system level, give people the confidence to do things that they see working over there without being dare I say it, told from oversight to do it uh, or directed to do it. So how do we, how do we genuinely at scale take learning and move it at pace? Um, which I think is probably a, a sort of a, a sort of a, 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 a bob way of saying <laughs> what David, Simon, David and Ian have just said yeah. far more articulately than me. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you know, this has actually been a really special uh, 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 event, and it is the first, and I hope not the last, because it isn't often that you see um, such uh, people of such weight, and I don't mean that in girth <laughs> terms. But, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There you yeah, go. It is, <laughs> it is nothing to do with the prevention strategy. I mean, I mean people who have a position such as yourselves facing uh, those who work for them. Please join with me in thanking our panel. And have a very lovely evening. Remember, go to the website. You can evaluate this session. You can tell us what you think about it. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much indeed. It's great. Okay.